So after going through the example, we've seen that the application of simplified DES applies a set of operations. We don't just do one big lookup in a table. We went through the key generation and the key generation is just a set of permutations, very simple permutations, rearrange the bits. And because it's just permutations, there's no security built into that. That is, if, we, if I knew K1 and K2, I can easily go backwards and get the original key because I just follow the permutations and do the opposite. So this is just for generating the keys if somehow I knew K1 and K2 I can because I know all the steps the algorithm is known by the attacker I can get the key. But what about the encryption which uses those two round keys K1 and K2 for the encryption algorithm we'd like it such that the attacker given the cipher text cannot go backwards and get the plain text without the key. Okay, if they don't know the key. Or they cannot derive the key. Or given a plain text and cipher text pair, if the attacker knows the original plain text and they know the final cipher text but they don't know the key, it should be hard for the attacker to find the key. Right? So sometimes the attacker may know the plain text and the cipher text, but they don't know the key. The algorithm should be designed so that it's hard for them to obtain the key. What makes it hard for the attacker? Well, the substitutions are important steps in the encryption algorithm. The S boxes take four bits in, produce two bits out. Going backwards from the S boxes, how do you go backwards? If I know that the two bits that were produced as output of the S box were one zero. If I know the two bits out were one zero, what's the input to the S box? So we know the output is one zero. What would the input say for S zero be? It could be one of multiple values. We have a one zero here, 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 and this location. So if I'm trying to break the cipher and working backwards, if I know the output of the S box, it doesn't mean I know what the input was. It could be one of four values. So that's where the substitution is important. The attacker doesn't know which of those four values. They would need to maybe try all four values and then keep working backwards. Similarly, exclusive OR is a substitution. In the exclusive OR, Where's a step? There are several operations of exclusive OR here. If we know the output of the exclusive OR, these eight bits, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, 1, what was the input? OR, even if we know the input and not the key, what was the key? Again, there's no one value. Okay, so. Sorry, if we know the output, how do we discover the key or the input? There are many possible values. So the substitution implemented by the exclusive OR and the S boxes are important for the security of the simplified DES algorithm and the real DES algorithm. In the same way that Vision Air Cipher, the one-time pad, use substitutions, they can create output ciphertext which appears random. What about all these permutations in here? So we've got some substitutions, but we've also got expand and permutate, permutate. The swap halves is a permutate. P4 is a permutate. And the initial and final permutations. The permutations means that we have some bits as input. If we do a substitution on those bits, then if we don't do a permutation, Whenever we have the same bits, we'll, we can get repetitions in the output. The idea of the permutations is to make the substitutions always apply on different bits in the input. And that's important when we do different rounds. That is, we apply the substitutions in the first round, 
and then if we apply them in the second round, if we didn't permutate, the second round may be applying on the same inputs as the first round, and there's no benefit of doing a second round. The idea of permutate is apply the substitutions in the first round, there's some permutations such that the second time we apply the same substitutions, it'll be on different bits because the permutate changes, mixes up those bits. And in general, if we have another round, like in real deaths, the next round we apply the substitutions, it'll be on different bits again because we've mixed them up each time. And we keep mixing up, substitute, mix up, substitute, and keep doing that, and that produces a more secure output. So in summary, the idea of the design and many block ciphers combine substitutions and transpositions or permutations and repeatedly apply them. How many times do we repeatedly apply them? Well, that's a design parameter for, for ciphers and that's what cryptographers try to design. What is the optimal number of iterations? What operations do we need? What are the lengths we apply them on? That was quite a long example we went through and in this course that's the only detailed example we'll go through for a block cipher, uh, a symmetric key block cipher. Uh, it's one of the easier ciphers to understand by going through via example. Others like AES require some different math to understand. So the point isn't to be able to do it by hand, the point is to show you that the operations themselves are quite simple. Permutate, XOR, use the S box. They're quite simple on their own, but combined create a, quite a secure output. And just to reiterate, the permutations are fixed. They are always this, these values. P10 is always 3527410986. So the attacker knows that, but still combined with the substitutions, simplified DES is considered reasonably secure. The S boxes are also known, defined and fixed. They don't change. So it's very simple to implement. Let's look at compare to real DES, because that's what we care about. Uh, so remember, simplified DES is just for teaching. As a function, we can think what we did to get the ciphertext, we took plain text, we applied the function, which is the initial permutation. The output of that, we applied this, what we call the round function, F, using K1, which is actually many sub-steps, permutates, XOR, S boxes. Then we swap the halves. Then we apply the same function but using K2 as input and then we do the inverse initial permutation. If you want to decrypt, you see that it's exactly the same functions are applied. We take the cipher text, do the original in initial permutation, apply the same function but use K2 first, apply the switch, the same function with K1, the inverse initial permutation, and we get the plain text. That is, the algorithm used for encrypt and decrypt are the same, but we use the keys in the opposite order. A good thing about that, and it applies in real DES as well, to implement DES, we just need one implementation. One implementation for the encryption algorithm, and it also does the decryption. Some ciphers, that's not true. Some ciphers, you need different code for encrypt and decrypt. With DES, it's the same. So it makes it easier to implement. What about the security of simplified DES? Of course, it has a 10-bit key. We can guess that. Right? We only 1,024 possible keys. I could just brute force all of them and uh, find the, the plain text from that. But ignoring that limitation of simplified DES, if you knew the plain text and if you knew the cipher text, how easy would it be to find the key? Well, people think it's quite hard. Okay, then people have done analysis and the point is that 
of our deaths even in two rounds is considered quite good because it's built just upon the design of real deaths. It may be possible for small values, but the algorithm itself is considered secure and good. And that applies more so in the real deaths. So let's compare them. Real deaths. 64-bit blocks, not 8 bits. Plain text, instead of the 8 bits that we use, would be 64 bits that we take as input. 56-bit key. So the user chooses a 56-bit value. And that's, there's a key generation algorithm. They generate 16 round keys. And the round keys are 48 bits. In simplified deaths, we generated two 8-bit round keys. Because it's just larger, longer values. Initial permutation, different length. The function, that grey box, actually the light grey box, same concept, same steps, uh, expand and permutate, XOR, S boxes, but just working on larger uh, uh, bit lengths. Instead of two S boxes, there are eight S boxes, and they are fixed and defined. Instead of two rounds, there are 16 rounds. If you write an equation for real deaths, take the plain text, initial permutation, apply a function, swap, apply the function with the next round key, swap, apply the function with the next round key, you do it 16 times, and then inverse initial permutation. It's just the same approach, but expanded in size. And it's considered secure. That is, the, the design of real deaths is considered secure. It's hard for an attacker, given a plain text and ciphertext, to find the key. The details I just include on the slides if you want to look. We'll just flip, flip through them just to highlight that well, it's a, about the same as what we did with simplified deaths. Right? This is saying that we have an initial permutation and then there's 16 rounds. There's actually a swap at the end and a final inverse initial permutation to get the ciphertext. But there's initial permutations. Instead of defined as the arrangement of 8 bits, it's on 64 bits. So that's, that's defined in the DES standard. It says, for example, the first bit on input moves to this position. The 58th bit on input becomes the first bit on output. The 50th bit on input becomes the second bit on output. So this, you have to remember for the exam, memorize this table, and then you'll be able to solve this. Now, you don't even have to remember real uh, simplified deaths. So it's not the point of remembering these definitions, but be aware that they are fixed. They don't change. Expand and permutate is defined. A round involves taking the right half, expand and permutate, XOR with the key, S box, permutate, XOR, swap the halves. Exactly the same steps as what we did with simplified deaths. And the S boxes are defined and there's just eight of them. and something about the key generation. So is it good? And why is it good? Uh, we'll, t we'll come back to the avalanche effect in a moment. The key size is not good. The user actually chooses a 64, or there's a 64-bit key used as input, only at 56 of those bits are used in the encryption. The other eight bits are do perform a parity check, an error check on the, the key itself. So from a security perspective, those eight bits are useless. That's why we sometimes just say it's a 56-bit key. Because the attacker just needs to guess those 56 bits. So there are 2 to the power of 56 worst case operations to do, about 10 to the power of 16 uh, attempts to do a brute force attack. And I think we gave some examples on brute force that 
1998, someone built a machine that would break it in three days. And today, 56 bits is considered too small to be protected against a brute force attack. So the key is not long enough. That's the major limitation of DES. But it's easy to make the key longer by encrypting with DES with one key, taking the output and encrypting it with DES again using a different key. Now the attacker has to guess both of the keys. Not 56 bits, but 112 bits. And we'll see triple DES applies that approach. Use the same algorithm, but use different keys. And we'll see that later. It can allow for 128 bits versus 64, even 168 bits it can allow. The reason for using the same algorithm is because DES existed for many years. Many people had hardware and software implementations. So if you can reuse that same implementation, you can uh, save time and you don't have to analyze the new algorithm. So triple DES became popular. Triple DES is three times slower than single DES, though. And that was the main limitation. The key size is a problem with DES. I thought I had a slide maybe here. This is the one. What about the design? Is it secure if, uh, if the key is not an issue? Well, one of the problems people thought with, with DES is that the algorithm itself was designed in private. That is, it was IBM and the NSA in the US were designing it, the people there designed it, and they didn't tell people how they chose the design. Why is the S box defined in this particular way? Why is P8 or, or the permutation this set of uh, rearrangements? That was not uh, released to the public, and therefore people questioned are there some weaknesses in the design or some deliberate flaws in there such that if you know those flaws you can decrypt without the key, you can break the cipher. Nowadays people consider no, that it was designed well, that there are no found weaknesses in there so it's considered a good and strong design. So there were questions about the motivation but most people think it is secure. The S boxes are were cons have been analyzed a lot and uh, considered an important part of DES and are considered secure. They provide non-linearity in that it's, we really think it's hard to go backwards from the S box. We can go in one direction easy, but going in the reverse direction is hard. And that's important for making it secure. They provide increased confusion. We haven't talked about confusion yet. Uh, Whereas the permutations provide increased diffusion. Let's go back to the definition of those two concepts very briefly. We skipped over them. What is diffusion and confusion? Diffusion, to spread things out. That's the idea, to diffuse the information. And with respect to our ciphertext, remember with our plain text, some of the classical ciphers, we said it's easy to do a frequency analysis attack. That is, we expect the plain text to have more E's than the letter Z. E is the most frequent letter. There are some statistics about the structure of the plaintext. That's always the case with plaintext. Diffusion is about applying some operations such that the ciphertext doesn't contain those statistics. That is, if E is the most frequent letter, maybe occurs 12% of the time in the plaintext, and if it, another letter occurs 12% of times in the ciphertext, then we don't have diffusion. But if in the ciphertext all letters occur equally, then we say there is diffusion because the statistics present in the plain text are no longer present in the ciphertext. How do they do or obtain diffusion? The permutations are important. 
do a permutation and then some function in general. There are some characteristics of that function. So the permutations are part of increasing diffusion. And another way to think of the result of diffusion is that the, uh, the algorithm, especially the substitution, gets to be applied on all the different bits on the input, not just on some of the bits. Confusion is about making the relationship between the ciphertext and the key complex. So it's hard to work backwards. Right? So the attacker, if they know the ciphertext, and they know even the plain text, it should be hard to find the key. So that's what confusion is trying to do to make it confusing between the ciphertext and the key. So even if the attacker knows some statistical characteristics about the ciphertext, even if they do know one character occurs more frequently, if the algorithm has confusion, it still should be hard to find the key. That's the idea. And confusion is usually implemented using substitution uh, algorithms, the S boxes in, in DES and other sites. Maybe the most interesting to you about diffusion and confusion is that they were the, the concepts and some of the concepts of ciphers were, were defined by Shannon. And those that have sat in my class last semester, what did Shannon do? Claude Shannon. Remember Shannon capacity? The capacity C equals the capacity of a data communications link is the bandwidth log of 1 plus the signal to noise ratio. Shannon des designed this or analyzed and developed this equation for capacity of communications but he also uh, analyzed ciphers and he came up with these concepts of what is an ideal cipher, what is confusion and diffusion. So Shannon was someone who made a large contribution to data communications but also security and cryptography. Let's try and finish on DES. What else have we missed? I think that's almost enough. Ah, the avalanche effect. How do we know if the output is secure? How do we know if the algorithm produces a good, strong ciphertext? Well, there are different tests that you could do. And one of them is testing for the presence of the avalanche effect. An avalanche is what? When maybe the concept is a small rock falls from the top of the mountain and that knocks some other rocks, which knocks more and they knock more. And at the end, there's many rocks or things falling from the mountain and creates an avalanche. So one small change at the top causes a large change at the bottom. And the concept is a, something to measure whether a cipher is well designed, if it's secure. If it has the avalanche effect, it's considered good. If it doesn't, it's considered bad. What does it mean with respect to ciphertext or encryption? The idea, if you make a small change in, say, the key or the plain text, but let's consider the key first, I take some plain text, I encrypt with key 1, I get ciphertext. I take the same plain text, I encrypt with key 2, where key 1 and key 2 are very similar, maybe one bit different. And then I get some ciphertext. Then the second ciphertext should be significantly different from the first ciphertext. In other words, a small change in the input should lead to a large change in output. And the same applies if we change the plain text. And it turns out DES has this effect. But let's, let's illustrate uh, first with an example on the, on the computer. I have some plain text which I'm going to encrypt with, with uh, DES. The plain text is the word security. Okay. How many bits? I want to encrypt it with DES. Anyone want to guess how many bits in this plain text message? 
Or how many bytes do you think? Normally one character on our operating system is stored as one byte. All right, so one letter is one byte. We have eight letters, we have eight bytes. There's no end of line missing hidden characters, so there's eight bytes or 64 bits. So it's a perfect size for DES. DES takes 64 bits in. I'm going to encrypt security, which really is re represented as a 64-bit value with DES. What if I added one more letter at the end? Then we'd have nine or uh, 72 bits, but DES only works on 64 bits at a time. So we'd need to apply DES on the first 64 bits, and then we'd need to generate the last 60, another 64 bits using that last letter and maybe pad it out. Padding is fill out the rest of those bits, maybe with some default value, like all zeros. So when we don't have a multiple of 64, we need to use some padding. Uh, we have a multiple of 64, so it's OK. So let's encrypt security with DES and just see the output, and then we'll encrypt something slightly different. And the software, and you're going to use this software in some homework tasks later. OpenSSL just in, implements many encryption algorithms. Encrypt using DES. And there's a mode of DES, a special mode or a, a particular mode, ECB mode. Not important yet. It will come up in a later, uh, later topic. You don't need to remember this. Take as input the plain text file, at, which is actually the, take the word security, but represented in the binary form. As output, minus O, I'm going to call it c1.bin. I call it .bin because it's going to be a binary output. It's not going to be readable like in a text file, I hope. And then the key. Minus K. How long should my key be? This is not simplified DES. This is real DES. Forget about simplified DES except for learning the algorithm. How big? 64 bits. This software doesn't want me to type in bits. It wants me to type in hexadecimal. How many hexadecimal digits? 64 bits. One hex digit is four bits. Hex goes from 0 to 15, so we need 16 hex digits. And I should choose a random key, all right? so that someone else can't guess my key. It should be random. But my random number generator is not working so well. <laughs> is that 16? All right, so there's 16 they're hex digits. So there's 16 hex digits. Convert each to a 4-bit number and we get our 64-bit key. It's coming up in a later topic. Uh, this ECB is a, is a mode of how we use DES. It's the way that DES handles splitting long inputs <laughs> into blocks and combining those blocks back together. And that mode actually needs another parameter called an initialization vector, IV. And for me, I'll just set it to all zeros. I think it's 16. Not important for this example. The last thing, by default, the software will pad the plain text. It will add some padding. I don't want any padding, because I know it's exactly 64 bits input, so no padding. And I did it wrong. It returned an error. What did I miss? Let's try it again. Encrypt. And I'll just copy my other example. This. Minus E for encrypt. And I better get this correct. What did I do wrong? Minus O U T, I think. Okay. 
not minus O, minus O, I have to spell out. Right. So encrypt using DES, ECB mode. Input file is p1.txt, which contains the word security. The output file will be c1.bin, it's wrapped around now. The key is the value I used. The initialization vector is not important. There's no padding. And let's look at the ciphertext, but let's first look at the plain text in binary. Let's see if it displays OK. The plain text. We'll try again. There it is. That's the plain text. All right, here is that. Uh, I'm losing control. Here is the ASCII encoding, whereas these are the eight bytes. This is S, E, C, U, R, I, T, Y. Okay, so just the binary uh, form of those letters so using ASCII. And DES encrypted that, and let's look at the ciphertext. XXD just shows us the, the raw data. There's the ciphertext. So there's 64 bits, as we'd expect. 64 bits in, 64 bits out. And the ASCII characters, what are they? R, N. What are dots? Well, this software says, shows dots. You know the ASCII has some unprintable characters. Backspace, delete, uh, escape. So the software doesn't print them. But if we look at the binary, these 64 bits, what do we notice? Plain text versus ciphertext. Do you see any patterns in the ciphertext? Or does the ciphertext look the same as the plain text? Well, not really. If you compare the 8 bits at a time, they are different. Right? It's hard to analyze with our eyes very quickly. There don't seem to be any patterns in the ciphertext. Right. There's no repetitions of 8 bits. Even there was, it, it maybe they were unlucky. Uh, so that's all. That's the ciphertext. And if we analyze that with some algorithms, we will find that those sequence of 64 bits in the ciphertext appear random. So they exhibit randomness. And we have a later topic on what does it mean to be random. But that's encrypted. We want to talk about the avalanche effect. P1 contains the word security. P2 contains the word security, but I've replaced Y with X. Let's encrypt it. All the same, same key, same algorithm. Different plain text we encrypt. And now let's look at those four files. We've got the two plain text values. Let's try them again P1 and P2. What's the difference between those two files in binary? There are two plain text files. I think if you look closely, all bits, all 63 bits at the start are the same. The last bit is different. The Y ends up, we get a 1 at the end. The X ends up, we get a 0 at the end. So the two plain text values are almost identical except for one of the bits. So a small change in the plain text. Now let's look at the ciphertext for each of them. Um, not going so well today. Try again. Plain text one, plain text two. Cipher text one, cipher text two. Cipher text two compared to cipher text one. Completely different. And that's what we want. In, that's one a very simple demonstrator of the avalanche effect. A small change on the plain text led to two different ciphertexts. Completely different, I say. Well, you could count the bits which are different. And we will not count them. 
but you, if you look and you compare each 8-bit value, you see some of the bits are different. That's what the avalanche effect is, and the desk has the avalanche effect. Two small, small changes on input produces large changes on output. I will not do it, but it will be similar if we change the key as well. Same plain text, slightly different key. How different? How many bits do you expect the two ciphertext values to be different by? They each contain 64 bits. You can ask someone in line if you like. How many bits do you think the ciphertext values are different by? On average. Half. All right. If you two, choose two random 64-bit values, choose two random 64-bit values, you expect some of the bits will be the same, some will be different. On average, half of them will be the same, half will be different, because there are only zeros and ones. So 32 bits should be the same, or 32 bits different. And with ciphertext, we expect to get random outputs. So if we have two random outputs, we'd expect 32 bits to be the, the same. Well, I don't know how many in this case, but if I tried a different pair of plain text and keep trying many times and count, I'd expect on average I'd get about 32 bits different. Sometimes more, sometimes less. If we do, then that's good. Back to our slides. This actually shows in the design of the rounds of DES how the avalanche effect uh, is applied. The next slides will consider two different plain text values. They differ by just one bit. Similar to my example then, there's a small difference in the plain text. And you apply DES and you get, in that particular example, 32 bits different with the same key. The second example, same plain text, two slightly different key values, and again the ciphertext differ, in this case, by 30 bits. If you tried others, you'd on average get 32. What's more, we can see the avalanche effect taking place in the rounds. Death involves 16 rounds. What this picture shows us, we're using the same key but two slightly different plain texts. The input plain text at the top starts with a zero in hex and at the bottom starts with a one. There's one bit different. When we do the first round of deaths, after the first round, there's one bit different. Actually, this is, yes, after the first round, there's one bit different. After the second round, there are five bits different. After the third round, 18 bits different. And then from the fourth round onwards, it oscillates around 30, 32 bits different, which is what we want. We expect half of them to be different. This is saying something about that the number of rounds used in DES, in this particular example, we need at least four rounds. The more, the better for security. If we only had two rounds, we wouldn't have the avalanche effect. If we stopped here, only five bits would be different, and that's not good. And in the second example, it's just changing the key. Similar. Two or three rounds is not enough to achieve the avalanche effect. You need more. Last thing on deaths. How many rounds should we have? How many? Eight. From this one, yeah, maybe even four or five would be okay. But more is better from security perspective. Keep mixing things up. Why not 32? They stopped at 16. Why not have 32 rounds? Or 100 rounds? Time. Every round involves applying some steps in the algorithm, and it takes time to encrypt. The more rounds, the more secure but the more rounds, the lower the performance for encryption. So it's a trade-off of performance. If you double the rounds, you double the time it takes to encrypt.
I think that covers deaths. There are some theoretical attacks on deaths. Uh, theoretical in that, for example, there's an approach using what's called differential cryptanalysis. Brute force attack on deaths takes about 2 to the power of 56 operations. There are some attacks that can break it in less. 2 to the power of 47 operations. About 250 times faster. But to do those attacks, the attacker needs to have 2 to the power of 47 existing plaintext values. They need to have megabytes, gigabytes of plaintext that they've had encrypted already. And that's not possible in many cases. So there are some theoretical attacks, but generally brute force is considered the best against this. This is considered secure nowadays, but the key is too short. We have 20 minutes to go. What can we cover? Any questions on deaths before we move on? You can answer the quiz question, encrypt using simplified deaths. Sometimes there's a quiz or an exam question, encrypt with simplified deaths. Okay. Make sure you find out the inverse initial permutation. It's not obvious to some people. Yep. We haven't got to hashing yet. Yes, yes. Yep. I think other algorithms, the avalanche effect is still important that we need to have a big difference from a small change. We will see that in hash algorithms. Yep. Okay, how do you go in the first quiz? Five out of five out of seven. That's okay. Questions before we move? Okay. Death is not the only cipher. There are many others. We will not go through others in detail. We'll mention the names of them. Uh, but because we only have maybe 15, 20 minutes left, to go through some of the next slides requires a bit more time. So we'll return to them next week. Double encryption. Because there's some complex attacks involved there. It doesn't mean we'll stop now. We'll move on to the next topic. Actually, we can say something about AES while we're here, but the double encryption we'll have to return to next week. There are other ciphers. DES was considered not good from the key length. Triple DES was considered too slow. So people designed, or the, the US government come up with the advanced encryption standard, AES. And that's widely used today. Considered secure, secure against known attacks, including brute force attacks because the key length is either 128 bits or larger. You can choose the key length with AES. 128 is common. 256 is, is recommended in some cases. Brute force attack on 128 bits is not considered feasible. AES uses some similar concepts to DES, rounds, uh, substitutions, transpositions. Uh, it uses 128-bit blocks, not 64 bits like DES. The number of rounds depends upon the key size you use. So with the smallest key size, it goes through 10 rounds of operations. It uses XOR. Uh, similar to DES, it, we XOR'd the round key with the current value. AES uses a similar thing. It uses S boxes, look up the matrix, return the value. But some of the other operations use some, some different math to uh, perform some operations, and it's a little bit long to go through in this course. But AES is widely used today. 
Most file encryption that you use would probably use AES. Some of your Wi-Fi traffic, if you would turn on encryption, will use AES. Sometimes when you use HTTPS to access websites securely, it will use AES. We're not going to go through any details of AES. We may use it with software, that's about it. And there are others. And this slide simply lists the names of some other algorithms, some of the, the popular ones. Uh, the, the, the person who designed it and the year, the number of bits in the block. You'll see most are 64 or 128 bits. And the length of the keys possible. Some of them use the Feistel structure, some use similar to AES, which is called a substitution permutation network, slightly different. But they often follow similar designs, slight variations. If you need to choose one, choose AES. If you want to be safe, choose AES with a 256-bit key. Okay. If you don't know, then choose AES. If you have a very special case uh, usage, maybe you would consider others for performance or for some other reason. We will need to return to this after we look at triple des and double des. Let's just introduce the next part uh, and then I think we can stop.